Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. I greet you all in Jesus' wonderful name. It is such a joy to be uh, coming live with the precious word of the Lord once again. Hallelujah. Before we delve into the word of the Lord, I have a very, very powerful, very profound and very deep word that the Lord has laid upon my heart. And I am absolutely certain that it is going to minister to your spirit. And the word is really, really going to transform your life. And the word is really going to challenge you to walk a very deep and passionate walk with the Lord. So before I do that, shall we pray? <clears throat> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Stand by me. Stand by me. I have no strength nor power of my own. Loving Savior, stand by me. Stand by me. Stand by me. Loving Savior, Stand by me. I have no strength nor power of my own. Blessed Savior, stand by me. <clears throat> King of glory, Yahusha Hamashiach, may this broadcast be covered in your precious blood. Let the angelic host protect the airwave and let the word, the message from your heart penetrate into the hearts of your people. Lord, I draw the hedge of the precious blood of the Lamb around this fellowship. In Yehoshua's mighty, precious and glorious name I pray. Amen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Once again, I greet you in the blessed name of the Lord. Today, I have a very, very profound word that I am going to share with you. <clears throat> Let me just set the stage. <clears throat> Let me just draw your attention to gospel according to St. Matthews. Turn to the gospel according to St. Matthews. <clears throat> and I'm going to read for you a few verses that are very, very unique. And <clears throat> we will certainly go very, very deep looking into these scripture, scripture verses. Uh, Matthews chapter number 4, verses 12 to 16. Let me read it for you. <laughs> now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into the prison, he departed into Galilee. <clears throat> and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast in the border of Zebulun and Naph Naphtali. Naphtalim, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Esaias the prophet. And what was the prophecy? The prophecy is found in Isaiah chapter number 9 and verse number 1. Very, very powerful, glorious prophecy in the Old Covenant. And Jesus is fulfilling this prediction by prophet Isaiah, which says, verse number 15, the land of Jebelon and the land of Naphtalim, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of the death, light is sprung up. <laughs> Hallelujah. Here we see in Matthew's gospel, chapter number four, <laughs> Jesus fulfills the Old Testament predictions. Jesus filled all the prophecies, verbatim. What was predicted about him through the seers and the prophets in the Old Covenant, Jesus fulfilled. But here, something is really spectacular that I want to draw your attention unto. Jesus had already established <clears throat> his headquarter in the ministry. But now what Jesus is doing, if we read verse number, let me read verse number, verse number 13 for you. It says, 
And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum. Jesus abandons his primary base, his primary headquarter for the ministry. Nazareth, the place where he was raised up, the place where he read from the scroll of Isaiah and initiated his ministry. Jesus leaves that territory and he goes to the region of Naphtali and Zebulun. This is what we are going to discover from the word of the Lord. Why would Jesus abandon Nazareth? And why would Jesus go towards Zebulun and Naphtali, the land of the Sea of Galilee? Hallelujah. Which is Upper Jordan. Hallelujah. Jordan. The Hebrew word is Yardan. The tribe of Dan settled down in the extreme northern side adjacent to Mount Hermon. And it is called Jordan Yardan, coming down below from Dan. Yardan. Hallelujah. So here we see Jesus leaves the area of Nazareth and Jesus makes a decision to go and dwell among two tribes of Israel. Among the territory of two tribes of Israel. Zebulun and Naphtali. Why would Jesus do that? You know, if you look into the word, Jesus never went into the lower extreme territory of Israel where there were Roman cities. You, you know, you hear a word called Decapolis. Just underneath was Decapolis. But here Jesus is fulfilling a prophecy. So that is what we are going to dig deeper in the Old Covenant. Do you know that Jacob's blessings that he pronounced over his 12 sons, they are very powerful, very unique, and very profound. You know, the entire prophetic discourse, he prophetically pronounces the blessing over his 12 sons. If you look deeper, you know, those, those blessings that he pronounced over his 12 sons, Upon those prophetic predictions hinge the destiny of all the nations of the earth. I do not have time to go into uh, the subject how, you know, the tribes, the, the, the ten tribes that dwelt in the northern Israel. The northern part was called Israel. And they, they, uh, they you know, they plunged into deep disobedience, anarchy and all kind of debauchery. And they broke the covenant of the Lord. And as a consequence... The Lord sent them into captivity, those ten tribes. And uh, are you asking me to share the broadcast? I, I, I don't know how to share it. Brother Ankit, if you are asking me. Well, <clears throat> these twelve prophecies that, uh, that Jacob prophesied over his twelve children are very unique and very, very powerful. And they are connected with the prophetic fulfillment of Matthew's chapter number 4. The prophecy that came through grand prophet Isaiah. Chapter number 9, beginning from verse number 1. Jacob lays his hand in a very peculiar fashion over his children. And he pronounces the blessings over them. Over Judah. If you look into chapter number 49. That's where, you know, we will... Uh, I, I won't be able to talk about... All the 12 tribes. I will just pick up, you know, two or three tribes. Judah. The scepter was not supposed to leave the tribe of Judah. And all the kingly lineage was supposed to come out of Judah. The kings would come out of Judah. Hallelujah. Did you know that Martin Luther, the great reformer, he calls these blessings in in, in Chapter 49 of Genesis, he gives a German term, Hiel Gestikta. Hiel Gestikta. The, the, you know, the, the whole roster of uh, special peculiar blessing that connect to the destiny of all the nations of the earth. Here, <clears throat> um, Judah carries a very, very special blessing. That scepter will remain with Judah at all times. And all the kings will come out of Judah. Even King Herod, 
Although Herod was not from Judah, the king that ruled over Israel the time Jesus was born, he was, he was, uh, he was actually from the lineage of Esau, Edomenian, and he was from the Hashmonian dynasty. We call them Edomite. So <clears throat> Judah had a very special blessing that kings will come out of him. Levi, the Levites, all the priestly lineage will come out of the Levites. And if you read verse number 27 of uh, Genesis 49, it is talking about Benjamin. And the blessing of Benjamin that Jacob pronounces is this, that Benjamin will divide the spoils, but taking the riches of God, he will partake the riches of God, the same thing that is said about Jesus in Isaiah 53, that he will divide the booty with the strong. Benjamin always begins in a wrong fashion, but Benjamin somehow ends up nicely. Hallelujah. And sometime begins well and ends up very badly. King Saul, King Saul was never in search of God and he became the king of Israel, not in God's perfect plan, but in God's permissive will because people wanted to have a physical king to rule over them. So God just permitted Saul to become their king. He was never in search of God. And 40 years as he ruled over Israel, he never looked for God. He never pursued the presence of God. He was after his kingdom, his domain, his throne, and all the material things. And if you read 1 Samuel chapter number 22, verse number 2, people of Israel during the reign of Saul, they were absolutely distraught. They were bitter on the inside. They were so discouraged and disappointed and people were under heavy debt. There was no blessing flowing when Saul the king was ruling over Israel. The spiritual landscape of the people of Israel was very dark and bleak and they were not thriving or prospering financially either. And emotionally they were very bitter inside because Saul was a very, very bad king. And he did not obey the commandment of the Lord. The Lord asked him to annihilate the Amalekites, but he did not. But then what happens? If you read in book of Esther chapter number 2 verse number 5, much, much later, several centuries later, there rises up another man by the name of Mordecai. Mordecai, the uncle of Esther. And you know the story. The seed of the Amalekite emerges again. Haman is again, Haman the Agagite is actually the seed of the Amalekite. God told Saul the king to destroy completely and utterly annihilate and eradicate the seed of the Amalekite, but he never did that. So the demon that you will not decimate and the demon that you will not fight against and will not destroy, your future generations will have to tackle the same demon. But you know, Mordecai is a godly man. You know the story. The gallows that Haman made for the Jews, he wanted to destroy all the Jews. You know, the devil is after the Jewish race because the Jews carry the promise of God. Unto them were given the oracles of God. Unto them was given the covenant. The promise of glory was unto them. And adoption belonged to the children of Israel. And the worship and the tabernacle and the temples, everything was given to them. The seers, the prophets, the patriarchs, they all belong to Israel. Israel is a blessed nation upon the earth. That's why the devil goes after Israel. Do you know that anti-Semitism is on the rise? Right now, as I'm talking, there are so many churches in Europe and West that are badly deceived by the forces of anti-Semitism. We who are true believers, bought by the blood of Yahusha HaMashiach, we must stand shoulder to shoulder with the people of Israel and pray for the peace of Jerusalem relentlessly. There is such a great reward and there is such a tremendous blessing Praying for Israel and being friends with Israel. Hallelujah. And we know how through Mordecai, who himself is a Benjamite. So Saul began badly, 
but another Benjamite finished it in a very, very nice way. The seed of the Amalekite was destroyed. Now, if you read 49th chapter of Genesis, verse number 17, another tribe, the tribe of Dan. What was the prophetic word for Dan? That Dan will fall backward. In Hebrew, the word means backsliding. The word Dan means judge or judgment. In the morning, I was teaching Eden, Garden of Eden. Garden of Eden had, has Aleph with Dan. Aleph is God, the ox, the head, God himself. And Dan is judgment. You place God before judgment. Then you have Eden, which is the city of pleasure. You remove God, the garden of Eden will become judgment. And we know the story fully well, how the judgment fell upon the entire mankind. Hallelujah. Dan is missing in Revelation chapter number 7. Hmm? So many Messianic Jews believe that Judas Iscariot was from the tribe of Dan. And they also believe that the Antichrist is going to come from the tribe of Dan. The last great dark ruler that shall deceive the nations of the earth. We are very much on the cusp, on the precipice of his arrival. He is about to manifest and the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be raptured out of this world. Hallelujah. And he's going to manifest. So Dan is associated <clears throat> with the Antichrist. And Dan, we do not find in the book of Revelation, is replaced by the two sons of Joseph, Manasseh and Ephraim. It is snake, the same snake, the coiled snake. Jacob says, Israel says in his prophecy. Hallelujah. Now, <clears throat> what is peculiar about Jabalun and Naphtali? Why would Jesus leave Nazareth and spend the rest of the uh, span of his ministry and his life with these two tribes, the tribe of Naphtali and the tribe of Jabalun? That is what we are going to discover. Hallelujah. Hmm. I want you to turn to book of Judges. Would you please? Book of Judges. And uh, please turn to chapter number 5. Book of Judges, chapter number 5. There is so much that, you know, I can share with you, but the time wouldn't permit me. So I am just uh, making it very, very precise and very concise, you know, cutting off so much. So turn to book of Judges. And I want you to open at chapter number 5. Book of Judges, chapter number 5. And I want to give you the backdrop so that we save time. Deborah is a mighty woman of God. Great judge in Israel. She, she was raised up by God to bring such a great awakening in Israel. Israel, the tribes of Israel were utterly divided. They were not gelling together as one cohesive unit. They didn't care for each other. So there was so much division and there was so much spiritual darkness. And majority of the tribes of Israel had backslidden. And God raised up Deborah and her associate Barak in those dark and turbulent times of Israel's history. So this mighty woman of God arose and she... Uh, she began to bring a revival among the tribes of Israel. What happened? Israel, the northern part of Israel, was besieged by an army. Great army. And that army, the leader was Sisera. And if you delve deeper, that army was not purely human army. You know, they were giants. And they were Nephilims and they were Gibrines. They were kind of a mixed breed, the mingled blood lineage that rose up against Israel because devil always hates Israel. He always looks to destroy Israel. Do you know that there are many nations upon the earth? They chant early in the morning, death to Israel. There are nations who are bent on doing evil to Israel. They dream to push Israel 
right into the Mediterranean Sea. So much of anti-Semitism. So Sisera was a giant. He was the seed of the Nephilim. And a mighty army came. And uh, Deborah and Barak, they sent, an, uh, they, they sent appealing message to all the tribes of Israel that they should assemble. The army that came against them and besieged them was very formidable. And Israel did not have military. Israel did not have weaponry. Israel did not have equipment to fight the enemy. So Deborah was trying to unite Israel, the tribes of Israel. But there was so much division. The, the tribes of Israel didn't want to do anything with the fight. So they were in their own comfort zones. They never came to fight when the enemy besieged. So that is the backdrop. Now let me give you certain scriptures. Hallelujah. I want you to turn to uh, chapter 5 of book of Judges and read verse number 18. First, let me read you, read for you a few, few other verses from chapter 5. Mm. Okay, let me just read uh, verse number 18. Judges chapter 5, verse number 18. Zebulun and Naphtali were a people that jeopardized their lives unto death in the high places of the field. So, you know, by the brook of Kishon, a massive army came and they besieged Israel. And Deborah and Barak, they had just a handful of soldiers. They did not have, you know, machinery, the equipment to fight the battle. They were not in any position to pose any kind of challenge to such a great and formidable enemy, the army that stood there. So what happened? When all the, all the tribes of Israel and their warriors, those who could wage war against the enemy, when all of them were requested to come and join against the enemy, they all chose not to come. They all refused. So who took the call? Who stood up? Zebulun and Naphtali were a people. There were only two tribes that came to fight this fierce battle. Zebulun and Naphtali, they understood fully well that the army of Sisera is, is really huge. And they are mercenaries. They were not ordinary human beings. They were Nafals. They were Gibreens. They were like mixed blood. They were mingled seed of the watchers and they would have utterly destroyed a little tiny puny army of Israel but still still Zebulun and Naphtali were a people that jeopardized their lives unto death in the high places of the field when Deborah and Barak summoned they called they were the only two tribes that responded they loved their people they loved the heritage of the Lord. They loved Israel. They knew that they could die. They knew that the battle would be really intense. They knew they didn't have equipment. They, did, they, they didn't have weapons or anything. But what the word says, they jeopardized their lives. Hallelujah. They did not care for their own life. You know what Jesus says in John's gospel? Chapter number 12 and verse number 25. Jesus says, he who tries to save his life, save his soul, will lose it. And he who willfully, you know, gives his soul away, will retain it. Hallelujah. I heard a great story. You must have heard about Sadhu Sundar Singh. An apostle of bleeding feet. I read his books while I was a new believer. And I decided that I will become a sage like him. A sadhu like him. His books really, really left an indelible impact upon my life. Sadhu Sundar Singh was going to Tibet. And he had one guide, tour guide with him, who was a local person from Tibet. And they both were going and talking. And Sadhu Sundar Singh was sharing the load. All of a sudden, as they were pressing through the mountainous terrain, and it was all snow-capped, snow-capped, uh, peaks of Himalayas. Sadhu Sundar Singh was going and his uh, guide said, we must hurry, we must hurry, let's walk briskly. 
He said, I am sensing that a storm is coming. Snow storm is coming. So we must go fast. So Sadhu Sundar Singh and the guide began to walk much, much faster. As Sadhu Sundar, Sadhu Sundar Singh was going, what he saw that there was a human hand coming out of the snow. So Sadhu Sundar Singh told his guide, he said, wait, wait, there is a man here. The guide said, no, 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 we cannot jeopardize our life. Snowstorm is coming, we all will die. Sadhu Sundar Singh shoveled the snow with his hand and he discovered that there was heartbeat and the man was alive. Sadhu Sundar Singh said to the guide, I can't afford to leave, this man is alive. The guide said, well, then, you know, it's your choice. I, I must run. So he started walking very, very fast. Sadhu Sundar Singh dug that man out of the snow, put him on his shoulder and began to walk. It was very hard for him to walk. But as the man was on his, on his shoulder, Sadhu Sundar Singh was a man loaded with the Holy Spirit. You know, life came back in the man. And the man was very grateful to Sadhu Sundar Singh. Sadhu Sundar Singh shared Jesus with him. And they both continued walking. Snowstorm did come. Boisterous snowstorm came. But it did not overtake Sadhu Sundar Singh and the other man whom Sadhu Sundar Singh rescued. But as they walked, you know, two, three miles, what Sadhu Sundar Singh saw again. Out of the snow, there was a shoe coming out. And when he dug it, it was the same guide. Same guide. He got caught up in the snowstorm and he died. Sadhu Sundar Singh checked his body. He was already dead. Then Sadhu Sundar Singh writes in his book, he looks up into the blue sky. Sky became clear after the storm. And it was written in the sky, he who will try to save his soul will lose. But he who loses the soul for my sake will gain it. Hallelujah. These two tribes, they loved Israel. They loved their people. They loved God's heritage. And they jeopardized their lives for their own people. They went to wage war even though they knew the enemy is fierce. They were mercenaries. They were butchering people. They were like Scythians. But they still went to fight because they knew God Almighty, God who cut covenant with their father Abraham, Isaac and Jacob is with them. They knew that they are the people of covenant. They knew that God will fight from their side. So both Zebulun and Naphtali, they jeopardized their lives. You know what Bible says in if, if you read uh, Revelation chapter number 12, verse number 11, it's a powerful scripture. It says they overcame the devil. And this is about the apostate church that will be left behind. And this is, a, this is about the Jewish remnant that will come to know the Lord during the seven years tribulation. Those two, two witnesses, you know, uh, Elijah and Enoch or Elijah and Moses, they will proclaim the gospel with such power, signs and wonders will happen that time. Signs and wonders will only occur during the tribulation period when those two witnesses preach the gospel with great power. And those 144,000, God will seal them with a tab on their forehead. They will preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus. Did you know that Jews did not get the privilege the kind of privilege we Gentiles got to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, they will receive that privilege. Hallelujah. The church that will be left behind will preach. Some of them will preach. There will be few who will take the mark of the beast, but there will be many who will awake to the hour and would know that they can't afford to take the mark of the beast. Hallelujah. You know, they jeopardize their lives. Bible says in Revelation 12, 11, they overcame the devil by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, the word in their mouth, the testimony of the lamb of God. And the third component in the scripture is they loved not their lives unto death. Who are Zebulun and Naphtali? It says, it says, verse number 18, they jeopardized their lives unto death and they went to wage war against the enemy. They went to defend their brethren. Hallelujah. Do you love your life or do you love the Lord? Are you willing to jeopardize your life for the Lord and for Lord's people? 
or would you just love your life? You know, church is so narcissistic. Loving the self, living in the comfort zone. This narcissism is loving me, me, me. Bless me, club. Bless me, club. Bless me, Lord. Prosper me, Lord. Bless me. Bless my relatives. We live for others. We live for God. Paul says, nevertheless, I live. Paul knew that it's not he who is living. He says, nevertheless, I live, but Christ liveth in me. And Christ is living his life. There are two lives. There is a life called bios, biological life. Paul employs two words in the New Testament. He, has, he is the major author of the New Testament. Paul uses the word bios from where we get the word biology. Bios life we received from the womb of a mother. We have bios life, but inside the bios life, there is another life which is much higher, much greater. It is the life of God. It is called Zoe kind life. It is God kind life. In this bios, there is a life hidden inside. It is God kind life. Paul the Apostle says, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And you know what revelation Paul receives? He sees Jesus hung on the cross and he sees himself too hung on the cross. He doesn't see Jesus only hung on the cross. He sees Jesus and Paul the Apostle both hung on the cross. And then he says, the life that I now live, it is Zoe life. It is Jesus living his life in me. So Zebulun and Naphtali, they went to fight. And this was a, a very, very supernatural kind of battle. I don't have time, much time, but I am going to tell you a few things. Few things that I believe you may not have pondered over. In this chapter, chapter number five, let me read a few things for you. Verse number 23. Let me take you to verse number 23. It says, Curse ye me, Roz, said the angel of the Lord. In the Old Testament, you find a term which is called the angel of the Lord. In Hebrew, it is Hamel al-Adonai. But in the original, it is Hamel al-Yahua. Hamel al-Malak. This angel of the Lord, who this angel of the Lord is? When Abraham was about to slay his son, an angel of the Lord appeared there. And the angel began to talk. And you know what the angel was saying? The angel said, I have come to know that you love me. And I am going to bless you. I am going to prosper you. That angel is talking as if he is Yahweh. He is Yahuwah. And indeed he is Yahuwah. There is Yahweh the Father in the Old Testament. And there is Yahweh the Son in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, God is a binary principle. Even though you do not find Trinity in the Old Covenant. But God, the Father, Yahweh, and God, the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The angel of the Lord, the one who is called Hamil al-Malak, is Christophany. This is the eternal king of glory. The, the uncreated son of the Most High God, who ever existed with the Father. Hallelujah. Who created this great universe by the power of his word, who sustains this universe by the power of this word. These multi-dimensional universe, we do not know how many dimensions are of this universe. It is Hamil al-Malak. He is the one who came and Abraham saw while he sat in, in the door of his tent. Three of them came. Right in the middle was this angel who is Jesus of Nazareth, Yahusha Hamashiach. He had a glorious body before he received a body in the womb of Virgin Mary. He says in, uh, in, in, in he, Hebrews chapter number 10, he says, burnt offering and sin offering you did not desire, but a body thou hast prepared for me. Lo, I have come to do your bidding. A body, a supernatural, glorious, flawless, impeccably pure body was created in the womb of Virgin Mary that did not have the contaminated human DNA. Hallelujah. But this Jesus existed, existed forever. So this is Jesus here. Jesus is showing up in the battle. Curse e miraz. This term miraz, I dug so many Hebrew resources. The scholars are very, very divided. Some say this is a place in the old Israel, which was called Palestine. Some say he is talking about the rest of the tribes of Israel. He says, Hamil al-Malak, 
it is Jesus of Nazareth. He says, curse ye bitterly. Curse ye bitterly. And the word for curse here is arar, which means pronounce a strong condemnation. Bring somebody under strong judgment. Bring somebody under judicial probation. Curse, therefore, because they came not to help, they came not came not to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. These mighty are, you know, that there are words called Raphaim, Gibrim, different kind of words in the Old Testament. They denote to those fallen angels who cohabited with women and produced a race of Nafalims. These Nafals, the mixed blood, the demonic lineage, fought a bitter battle against Israel. Did you know why? You know why the enemy went up against King David? Um, if you read the uh, 24th chapter of Samuel, book of Samuel. If you read 24th chapter of book of Samuel. If you read 23rd chapter, you find uh, 24th says, the devil became angry at David. And he deceived David that he may take a census of the people of Israel. And as David took census, the anger and the judgment fell upon him. In the 23rd chapter, you find the secret. David slew all the giants. They were remaining giants. Joshua and the children of Israel did not really wage war against the giants. They did not retrieve the territory that were possessed by the giants. So they lived on. So David annihilated all the giants, and the devil became really mad at David that he insinuated and he deceived David to take the census of Israel so that the anger of the Lord may come, come against David. Hallelujah. So here it says, this is Jesus who is Hamil, Hamil al-Adonai, the angel of the Lord. Because they came not to help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. These mighties are those armies of the dark forces. Hallelujah. Now, let me give you another scripture. Mm. I want you to read verse number 20. Judges chapter number 5 and verse number 20. Look at this verse. This is very, very powerful. I spent several months digging this scripture from the original Hebrew resources, from the Textus Receptus, from the Masoretic text, from even the Qumran scrolls and so many other resources I studied about this scripture. Verse number 20, they fought from heaven. The stars in their course fought against Sisera. Sisera was leading a vicious army of mercenaries. They came to destroy, decimate Israel. They had the blood of those demonic entities in them. So the angels fought against the forces of darkness. The water, you know, the Lord spoke to the water and a massive flood came in the brook of Kishon. The Lord himself was fighting. Jesus is here. Verse number 23, it is the Lord. It is theophany. It is Jesus. Hallelujah. Pronouncing judgment. He pronounced judgment. The word is arar. He said, curse them because they loved their lives. They came not to fight the battle of the Lord. And let me give you another thing right now. Turn, read with me. Um, verse number 19. Judges chapter number 5, verse number 19. It says, the kings came and fought. Then fought the kings of Canaan in, in Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. They took no gain of money. The battle was fought. The angels got involved. Supernatural forces from heaven fought against this great army of the mixed breed who came against the people of Israel to destroy them completely. The angels fought. The Lord Jesus showed up himself. And when these people fought, and the armies were utterly defeated and they left the booty. There was huge plunder, silver and gold, 
plenty plunder. Now look, verse number 19. They took no gain of money. Naphtali and Zebulun, they did not go after money. Two special things. Why did Jesus go? Why was Jesus attracted? Why was Jesus drawn to dwell among Zebulun and Naphtali? He saw two characteristics among them. They did not love their lives. They loved the Lord. They gave the Lord the first place in their lives. So much so that they didn't even love their lives. They rather jeopardized their lives. And the second thing, they did not love money. The original Hebrew word here for money is kishif. Kishif. It's a very unique word. You know what kishif means? Kishif means silver in Hebrew. And kishif also means money in Hebrew. Why money is silver? Because silver is corrosive metal. Silver is not eternal matter. Silver gets corroded and silver is destroyed. Silver vanishes. So is money. The, the internet was giving me problem. You know these two tribes of Israel, Zebulun and Naphtali, they would not love their lives. They would love the Lord. These two tribes of Israel, Zebulun and Naphtali, they would not love money. They were not lovers of money. You know how much church today is lover of money? How they twist the scriptures and teach false cult of prosperity. It's all about money, 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 money. It's all about loving me, 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 myself, self. It's all narcissistic system. These two tribes, they did not love their lives. They did not love Kishif. Kishif is silver. Silver is money. Money is temporal. Hallelujah. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Your heart will, heart will follow your treasure. Your heart will pursue your treasure. Who is your treasure? My treasure is Jesus of Nazareth. My treasure is the presence of the Lord Jesus. I pursue nothing in this world except him. He is the one who satisfies me. In and out. Hallelujah. He is the unspeakable gift of glory. He is my lifeline. He is the very foundation of my life. Him I seek. Him I pursue. In Him I live. In Him I move. In Him I have my being. He is the joy of my heart. He is the delight of my soul. Hallelujah. I love Him wholeheartedly. Didn't Jesus teach when somebody came and wanted to have the gist of the entire uh, law of the Lord and the prophets, old covenant and the new covenant? And the Lord said, Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. For this is the first and the foremost commandment. You love the Lord and not the money. When you love the Lord, you don't love your life. You lay your life at the foot of the cross. Why would Jesus go and live with Zebulun and Naphtali? You know with whom Jesus lives today? Jesus lives with those people who do not love their lives, but who love the Lord. Jesus lives with them who do not love the money, the filthy looker of money, who do not trade their anointing, who do not merchandise and prostitute the anointing, who do not twist scriptures to get money from people. Hallelujah. Let's love the Lord. Let's love the Lord. Love the gold. Gold is eternal. Gold is Jesus. Jesus says, come and buy from me. Pure gold. Chandi, temporal hai. Kishif. Kishif ka matlab chandi, money. They did not love Kishif. Naphtali or Zebulun. They did not love money. They did not love silver. They loved the Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, I have delivered your word. Lord, make your people fall in love with you. Lord, you said curse them. Curse them who loved their lives, who would not jeopardize their soul, who would not come to the aid of the Lord, who would not fight the battle of the Lord. You said curse them. And you fought the battle by yourself. 
and you summon the angels of heaven, the stars in their courts fought against Sisera. And Lord, you decimated the armies of the enemy. You will fight our battles only when we love you, only when we love not the material world and all that the material world can offer us. Hallelujah. Lord, I pray that these people who heard your word, Lord, that this word will latch unto their soul, unto their very DNA and will challenge them and will cause them to introspect their very lives, whether they love money or they love the Lord, whether they love their lives or they love the King of glory. Hallelujah. I give you praise, Lord. I give you, I give you praise. I bless your name, Jesus of Nazareth. Hallelujah. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you love the Lord and love not the money, if you love the Lord and you love not even your lives, Jesus will live with you and will not abandon you. Hallelujah. God bless you. Amen.